you, Dan. I hope um, what I hope that did was give uh, the audience some sense of the Quali Foundation in general, Quali student in particular, maybe some of the you know the, the vision and and how we're organized. And now we're really going to start uh, honing in on on the main topic for today, which is which is understanding enrollment. Um, and again, the, the point is to equip people who are participating in this training with enough knowledge that they can start digging into some of the business requirements and our business artifacts and, and understand what they're looking at. So that's, again, I'm going to try to keep that main goal in mind, is that it's really to equip you with the ability to go in into the wiki, start looking at business artifacts, doing gap analysis, understanding what we've done thus far, um, so that you can be productive members of the quality community. So to that end, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our process, our framework, and the scope of enrollment. And um, so I figure if Stephen Hawking can do a brief history of time and under 100 pages, I certainly can do a brief history of chaos requirements and a couple slides. So this is just enough to help you understand maybe some of the terminology and some of the things that you might see on the wiki and why there's maybe some discrepancies between enroll curriculum management and currently enrollment. So I'm going to try and do this as quickly as po possible and not give you too much extraneous information. Um, the Big Bang. So in the beginning, we envisioned five quality student releases. And these were curriculum management. If you look at our old um, product management material, our, our promo materials, you'll see something we called R1, which is curriculum management. And then release two was enrollment and program audit. We had admissions, student financials, and scheduling. And then we actually started releasing products and we realized that there was a flaw in our naming convention because we realized we were going to have multiple releases of releases, and it got a little cumbersome, obviously. So it's like, what, release one of release one? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So instead, um, instead of calling them releases, um, we renamed them to modules. This makes a lot more sense, and it's probably very obvious after the fact. But um, so. Each of these now curriculum management is we call a module, and each one has subsequent releases. Uh, so you'll see instead of R1, now we've referred to it as curriculum management. And then we've had release 1.1 and release 1.2 of curriculum management. Um, same thing with enrollment. Uh, historically, we've called it R2. Uh, now we're really transitioning, particularly the old guard. It's a little bit hard to let go. So you'll still hear people call it R2. Really, they mean uh, enrollment management. So the reason I raise it is when you start digging into some of the uh, materials on the wiki, you may see some data references to R2 and R1, particularly as they relate to requirements methodology. So, OK, and so let's talk about our methodology for gathering requirements. Uh, for, for quote unquote R1, curriculum management, I'm, I'm calling it the uncertainty principle because uh, requirements were a little bit of a black hole. Um, meaning what we did is we wrote collective use cases and all the SMEs and BAs got together um, and wrote, we were actually called the use case team at the time, and we, and we wrote collective use cases that were supposed to represent how we wanted the system to operate. Uh, the problem with that is there was no institutional traceability. So if you wanted to dig in a little bit more detail and understand where you needed config you know, configuration or what, maybe where there was some deviation across institutions, you really couldn't get at that information very easily. So we went to a different methodology, which is what at the time we cleverly termed our R2 methodology, which now I would encourage you to think of it as our enrollment methodology. And this is the, the method I call the expanding universe because, um, uh oh not sure what happened there. All right, I broke my stride there. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> Stephen Hawking didn't like me co-opting his, uh, his book. So. Okay, so uh, our two methodology, again, is what I would call the expanding universe. Because in this case, we had each institution contribute their own individual institutional requirements. 
And as it turned out, enrollment being as large as it is and covering as much of the information that it needs to cover, it ended up being over 30 different functional topics. Um, these topics, again, I don't want to weigh you down with too much detail, but for, for, um, for a variety of reasons, these topics were what we called melanges. So you'll see this word melange on our wiki. Really what that does is represent um, a grouping, a, a, is a topic area. And I think it just was such a weird word that everybody knew when we said melange, people knew exactly what we meant. If you said topic or collection or requirement set, people wouldn't really know. But uh, anyway, so we had eight different institutions gathering requirements across 30 different functional areas. Um, and the group that was responsible for doing this was known as the KS Business Requirements Team. Okay, so then we got to set up for enrollment and we realized we had a lot of good information, but we had a lot of good information. Uh, you take eight institutions multiplied by 30 functional topics and you have essentially 240 sets of requirements that had to be boiled down into a single set of system requirements. So uh, this is the unifying theory that I'm calling the unification. Last uh, January, the analysis team was formed in order to really to take this, this good set of rich institutional material and turn it into something that the developers can consume in terms of KS requirements. So this slide may be a little tricky to read. Um, you may have to look at it offline, but essentially it represents that we had um, could you, uh, could you pop, just, thank you. <laughs> Wiggle the thing. Wiggle the thing, okay. Not Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so we had uh, eight institutions contributing information across 30 melanges, and um, the analysis team first did a synthesis of that material, which was essentially a matching and sorting exercise, where we said, you know, let's see what, what's the commonality of, across institutions with certain requirements matched and sorted, but there was really not any true, um, real hardcore analysis done at that point. Um, that really happened when we moved in what we call our cross-functional analysis and design, which it wasn't just an analysis because those were VAs and SMEs, but once we included UX and services, we were really able to get to an in-depth interpretation of the materials and really understand what functionality we were trying to get to and how to represent those concepts. So I think for a shorthand, you'll often hear the a, uh, referred to as the A and D work, and that's really the work that was done um, by the analysis team in conjunction with services in UX. Okay, I know that's a lot of information, but what this chart is also meant to represent, even though as of today, we have what we think are a much better, cleaner set of requirements from which to start parallel delivery, we understand that these requirements are going to go through iterations once we move into parallel delivery. Each team's going to pick it up and they're going to iterate through and they're going to iterate on concepts and further clarify and further refine. So these are all living documents. So this is just, we should view this as a one large continuum. The material that's out there today isn't the material, it's, it's the material as it currently exists. The last thing I'll say on requirements, and we'll dig in more specifically in requirements in our deep dive section, sessions and actually look at requirements, but when I say the word requirements, it's probably better to use the term business artifacts because there's really a lot more than your simple requirement statements that you might be used to seeing. We have terminology, we have your traditional requirement statements, ability to, ability to, um, but we also have user stories, um, which is going to be part of our development methodology. We have business process models in those areas where it makes sense to have them. Uh, we have examples of rules. Rules are going to play a big part of our enrollment um, uh, implementation, and so really understanding what kind of rules and, and when they get executed, et cetera, is important, and then also data. So there's actually quite a bit under this umbrella of uh, system requirements. <laughs> And Mike, I might need a 10-minute warning <laughs> because I blabber on a lot, so five minutes might be too late for me, so maybe give me a heads up when it's 10 minutes. You have 20 minutes right now. Oh, gosh. I can slow down then. Okay, so that's kind of, that hopefully gives you a sense of how we got from, from when we started collecting requirements. Um, 
low those many years ago, I, I think we started doing requirements gathering for enrollment um, like fall of 2008. <laughs> So anyway, this has been an ongoing process, but hopefully that gives you a sense of um, where we started and how we got to where we are now. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about what's evolved as a functional framework of how we think about enrollment, and hopefully it's a framework that will be useful for you. It's one that not only reflects the functionality that we have to um, provide via enrollment, but also reflects a logical build sequence. So it's a framework that primarily functional, but also has value to the development side of the house. So let's break down enrollment. If you think about enrollment, you've got an institution-facing portion, and I use institution as opposed to admin because you may include faculty in that. So these, if you think about it, it's that functionality that's facing away from the student. And then you've got your student-facing portion of enrollment. Um, if we think about enrollment, it's as most basic. We've got the ability to offer courses, have students, so on the institution offers the courses, students then register for those courses, and then we grade students in those courses. Okay, so that's like the really basic view of enrollment. But let's, let's step back a little bit and broaden that, that thinking just a little bit we, and layer in program. So if we think then about layering program, We've got the ability to offer programs, which students may then want to explore before they actually enroll in a program. Once they enroll in a program, they want to plan their way through the program. How are they best going to complete through that program? And then both the institution and the student are going to want to assess their progress as they're in the program. So this inner circle is something that happens on a term-by-term -term basis. When you move out this broader circle, this happens you know, maybe once or twice in a student's uh, lifetime at the institution. If we take one more step back and think about some of the, the broader functionality or some of the, maybe the support functionality to help this happen, on the institution-facing side, you just got to get your system set up. You got to, you know, set up certain parameters so you know when students can register. Set up your calendar, your academic calendars, and your terms, etc. You also need to obviously set up users so people can interact with the system. And on the student side, they're going to want to manage their own information and perhaps their system preferences. So, hopefully, this provides a very high-level overview of um, enrollment. So in keeping and thinking about this functionality, what I'm going to do next is layer on um, our actual functional areas, what we call our functional areas on this diagram. Oh, last but not least, sorry, one more fade. Last but not least, the kind of the nugget, the nucleus of all this is the academic record, which stores all this information. And then we also have these concepts of holes and exemptions where we're a little bit cross-cutting, that is, they both have a student-facing aspect and an institutional-facing aspect. I hope that's the last page. Oh, and then, okay, one more. And then you've got the catalog. So if you think about it, that the catalog is, um, that defines what courses and programs you offer. Okay? So hopefully that gives an overview. I think I'm done now. I think that gives an overview of enrollment. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is layer on sort of our qualified if you will, um, functional areas over this diagram. So again, we've got the student-facing portion and the institution-facing portion and the student-facing portion. Um, now I'm going to work from the outside in because this is kind of from a development sequence. You're probably going to want to think about setting up your environment and then honing in on, on the course functionality. So the setting up of of the basic environment, meaning setting up your course registration environment and your time-based environment, your academic calendars, et cetera, we call that setup. So that's one functional area that, that all that happens under the umbrella of setup. And then when you think about setting up users and having students manage the, their user information, that's what we call people and permissions. Okay? So we've got setup and we've got people and permissions. Next, let's jump down to courses. If we think about what's off involved in courses, we've got co the ability to offer courses, which oddly enough we call course offering. We have the ability for students to register in courses. We call that area of functionality course registration. And we have the ability to give grades, and, and it's really more than grades, so we call that course assessment. 
So now we're up to five functional areas, setup, people and permissions, course offering, course registration, course assessment. Now if we layer program in, we've got program offering, which is the offering of program. We've got program enrollment, which is getting students into programs. We've got program assessment, which is monitoring students' progress in programs. And then when we had both the Explore program and the planning pro their, so exploring getting into a program and planning their courses once the students in the program, we're going to combine those on the umbrella of academic planning. Because they may happen at different points in the student's life cycle, but they still happen under the umbrella of academic planning. Then at the center of all this is the academic record, which um, it may seem like a weird quote unquote functional area because it's really more of a thing than a function, but it's so big that it really kind of requires its own um, self-study. These other holes and exceptions um, are things that are really cross-cutting, so those actually get absorbed into other functional areas because they kind of show up all over the place. You can exempt any rule. You can exempt just about anything, so it kind of shows up in all these other functional areas. The last thing I want to do is layer some of the, our curriculum management module and some of our contributions that are happening on top of this. So again, um, our catalog is really gets managed by curriculum management. So curriculum management interfaces with enrollment at the point of program and course offering. Um, we have two contributions that are, that are under development that are significant here. One is UW My Plan, which is really an academic planning tool, and so it will interface with enrollment primarily at those touch points of academic planning. And then we have this, the um, contribution with uh, Sigma, which is really, it's about student financials. We still haven't settled on a name. So <laughs> If you hear student accounts receivable and student financials, it really means the same thing. Sorry about that. We'll get it worked out before quality days. Um, but really, for the purposes of enrollment, the, the touch point will be around course registration where you have tuition and fee assessments. So that's where they intersect. So I guess what I, what I would ask is that you start internalizing these 10 functional areas and that really is how we sort of organize, not sort of, that is how we've organized our requirements and likely to be how we're organizing our parallel development. So hopefully it's a good functional framework for you to think about enrollment. Before, um, how am I doing on time there, Mike? Oh, you're I'm way ahead of time. Oh. You're, you're fine, you have like 15 minutes. Oh, all right. So just for everybody, just. So, you know, I think our, our, our uh, approach here is we're always going to start on time, and if we end early, we end early. So, yeah. <laughs> Before delivery, <laughs> ahead of delivery schedule, that would, be, that would be great. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about scope of enrollment, particularly as it relates to these 10 functional areas. So, for those of you, we'll, um, We'll probably talk more about this in, in subsequent sessions, but understanding sort of how we've been thinking about delivering enrollment, I think it was pretty clear early on that, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate to deliver it as one giant monolith, that we're probably going to have to phase it out into um, logical releases. And so the current strategy that we um, have embraced, that the board has embraced is what we're calling E1, which is the first release of enrollment, um, deliver the basics. So basically, get at, get on, release a, a enrollment system that can support the basic functionality of our current student information system. So you can, basically, that it would be production ready student enrollment system, but very bare bones, very basic, very admin facing. Um, so E1 is deliver the basics, and then E2 and beyond is what we're calling deliver the vision. So what this graph is meant to represent, if again, if we think about the two pieces of enrollment, one piece being institution facing and one piece being student facing, and we think about these 10 functional areas, what this image is trying to convey is the extent to which each of these areas will be addressed in E1 versus E2 and beyond. There is no science behind this particular graphic. This is really solely for information purposes. But 
I think the first thing you'll see is you can see where the big effort is going to be. You know, course registration, very big. Um, program assessment, very big. So it gives you a sense of the size of each of these functional areas. And then the darker shaded areas is a representation of how much of that functionality we think will at least touch on um, anyone versus that which we're just not even going to address anyone. And right away you see that around academic planning there's in program assessment, you know, it's going to be pretty bare bones. It's going to be things like degree audit, um, uh, but probably in basic satisfactory progress assessments, but not a whole lot beyond that. So you'll also note that much of the student-facing portion of E1, uh, there's actually not a whole lot beyond course registration that's going to be student-facing. So this is really about a back-end replacement system. That's what E1 is, is meant to be. If you want to track our scope, there's a work in progress scope document that, I, that I'm linked to, I have a link to, um, and that's what we're going to be working with. We're to, we keep iterating through it, iterating through features, things that we are believe are going to be in scope versus out of scope, or in scope for E1 versus scope to E2 and beyond. That is primarily under the purview of the functional council that I work with on, on refining the features and the scoping, and it's, it is a work in progress, but you're welcome to monitor um, how we're doing there. I think I may have finished early. Wow. I give over my time to Dan Simon. He's going to introduce us to curriculum management. Wow, I feel so special. <laughs> um, so I, how is my volume? Well, you can Am get your loud and aerial. Yeah, we can hear you. You know, when okay. no one asks questions, you can actually plow through your material much faster. <laughs> it's so true. It's like, you know, divide by three without question. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a bad okay, time for the audience. All right, give me a second to share my goodies. <laughs> 